uh, the European farms. And Africans resented this, even when they were wealthy and they were rich and they uh, were educated. And they were not allowed to grow these things. And it was, in my opinion, sheer discrimination. There was a case of European farmers actually demanding that Africans should come and work on their plantations. They were a source of cheap labor. And because in those days, collective bargaining, that was non-existent, the, the wages which were in fact paid to the Africans was never adequate, and that was another one of the major points of grievances. The African soon proved a ready source of labor. For it had not taken him long to realize that he needed money, not only to pay the taxes which a European government had levied on him, but also to buy the European goods which were flooding into the African market. By leaving his village and going to work for the European, that money could be earned. Life began to take on complications which were hard for the African to understand. Some things were even harder for the European to understand, like the demands of African workers who soon began to sense they were being unfairly exploited. They wanted uh, more pay, and uh, most of all, they didn't like Kipande. Kipande was a document that the African was supposed to carry everywhere he went, looking for a job. Kipande stated the name and address and the home uh, area from which he came, the location, his tribe, etc., etc. And then it had to record every single job he did, where he, when he was employed and when he was dismissed. And if it turned out that at a particular time he didn't have employment, that was enough to be a vagrant. And if he was in any town or anything, so that he was arrested. So, in fact, an African could not be in any one of the urban areas without employment. And uh, that was very, uh, very un unfair to him because if he wanted to come and seek employment, uh, he, was, he was still committing a criminal offense. Kipande was a sort of reg re registration which was confined only to African labor. And it was necessary that an African must carry it everywhere. And the people hated it because it was not proper registration, but only to check on the Africans wherever they work. By 1921, feelings were running high. Led by a young Kikuyu, Harry Thuku, demonstrations and protests rocked the colonial government. The main demand was the repeal of the Native Registration Act, known as Kipande. Harry Thuku himself dispatched a cable to the British Prime Minister. As the agitation spread, and riots flared, Harry Thuku was arrested. He was Kenya's first nationalist to be detained. We were then beginning to see the early manifestations in Kenya of what we now understand to be apartheid in South Africa. You remember the early settlers who uh, came to, uh, to Kenya, most of them came from, uh, from South Africa. Well, the color bar in Kenya was, I'm afraid, absolute uh, exactly like apartheid in South Africa, except it didn't have that name. Uh, the, the, the residential areas, vast amounts of land were kept, housing areas were kept for Europeans. Uh, in the title deeds and the grants, uh, the no person other than of pure European descent could own a house there, could lease a house, could rent a house, could mortgage the house, could even be a guest in a house, except as a pure domestic servant. Uh, in the restaurants, the same thing. You had uh, European uh, restaurant licenses, you had Asian eating houses and African eating houses. And nobody was allowed to eat in, in, an, in an area of, uh, you know, in a, in a restaurant of another race. People began to talk openly in churches and outside against the colonial regime in Kenya. There were so many churches which even got started. Like in 1932, there was the Holy Ghost Church, which started just in this, in this particular province, Nyanza. And there was also Dinia Musambwa, which also started during that time. All their aim was that the time has come for European settlers to leave the land for the people. 
It was the translation of the Bible's message into many Kenyan languages that started to have effects that the missionaries had not foreseen. Some of the new converts split from the establishment and began to set up their own independent churches. Others took a political message from the teachings of Christ. I think that as Christian education, not only in Kenya, elsewhere, does produce the nationalist movement, um, that is um, a sort of side product. Um, it is the gospel itself which sets people free and gives them dignity and gives them education and then they um, see their lack of freedom um, and, and struggle for it. But the church as such um, doesn't have political and nationalist plans. Um, it hasn't got that as a direct objective and this would be true throughout southern Africa and every, any, anywhere else. On the one hand, to function, you need to function with the authorities, with the establishment. And so you have to give ground there. Um, but on the other hand, to have integrity, you have to press forward with your educational development, knowing all the time that um, in the end this will undermine the colonial regime. This is the National and also the Empire program. The Right Honourable Malcolm MacDonald, His Majesty's Secretary of State for the Colonies. We who are responsible for the government of the British colonial empire are engaged upon a great adventure. The task is enormous. The problems are innumerable. We sometimes run into troubles, and our ultimate goal is still far away. Let us, in this present generation of colonial servants, see to it that the millions of our fellow citizens in the colonies are better off when we lay down our responsibilities than they were when we took them up. The giving of responsibility is an essential part of Britain's policy in Africa. The first step towards self-government is to delegate responsibility to the councils of local tribes. Much of the progress in social welfare is in the hands of these councils. Here, the local chief has other responsibilities too. He collects taxes for the government. The chiefs among the Kikuyu are not traditional. The British had to invent the word chief among the Kikuyu because they had no chiefs. And uh, while they were promoted, they become government officials. So while all the time the British were in the colony, they were paid government civil servants so that they always agreed with whatever the white men said. That's why the chiefs were not very popular among the Kikuyu. Everywhere in East Africa, the chiefs administer their own courts of justice. The judge is the tribal chief. They will come and then they said that we want you to produce to us one of you to be the chief of this area. And then people will stand up about four or five and then people will line behind them. And after lining behind them, they will register and say that, oh, we have seen. But of course they had come with somebody in their mind whom they wanted to be the chief. They said that you so and so, you have selected so and so, so and so, but King George has decided that so and so will be your chief. Ah, 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 we refuse, but they won't care. They say, clearly, he will be your chief. But they had little influence on the Kikuyu Central Association, who elected a young man called Jomo Kenyatta as secretary. In 1931, he went to London to lobby for the return of tribal lands. Kenyatta was again in London in 1936 when the Italians invaded Ethiopia. This new aggression against Africa was an outrage, just when colonialism was beginning to be challenged elsewhere. In Britain, African students like Kenyatta were in the forefront of popular support for the Ethiopians. He organized International African Friends of Abyssinia Society. And when the Emperor Hail Selassie arrived in London in exile, the first African to welcome him was none other than Jomo Kenyatta. And the effect here was that the Africans in London were aroused as to the importance um, of organizing themselves to demand future self-government and independence. I came across in 1938 a statement made in the newspaper that a certain European settler who was their representative had asked the governor in the Digital Council to give him any assurance 
that whenever there is a conflict between the land matters, between the white and the black people, the interests of the white will always prevail over those of the, native, the African native. I was angry and wrote a letter protesting about it. It was printed. Henry Moria was already publishing political pamphlets for an African audience. But when the newspaper refused his second letter, he began to feel that African opinion needed new channels. Then that's how I got the idea of uh, owning a newspaper in which the African opinion would be expressed fluidly. The title of my newspaper was Mumenyereli, which means the caretaker. What sort of things were in the paper? The things were in the paper is just like to educate African people, you know, about how to help themselves and also um, say so like a black people wage was very low and uh, their condition of living was very low and that paper you know he was writing to try to express about feeling of the people how they feel and how they are put down in many ways how did people respond to the paper oh they like it very much because they see it's their need what they need is what he's writing you know, and express for them in a paper, you know, what they are feeling. When political demands were discussed openly, the authorities suppressed them. The Kikuyu Central Association, which had been active for nearly 20 years, was banned in 1940. The colony was still governed by the all-white Legislative Council. Not until 1944 did they appoint the first African member, Eliud Mathu. But a single representative was not enough. It was in 1944 when uh, uh, the British gave us chance to start a party which was called Kenya African Study Union. And people rejected, although uh, they started Kenya African Study Union, but they rejected saying that they have nothing to study. They know their problems already, and they want just direct representation in parliament. And so, very soon, uh, it was changed from Kenya African Study Union to Kenya African Union, which actually started meeting in large numbers everywhere to oppose the colonial regime. First of all, they started it very quietly by saying that they want only cooperation in the government. Later, they had to demand that they wanted to actually control the government. Uh, Self-government became a demand soon after the war. By this time, African political ideas had been uh, inspired by uh, the visionaries like uh, Marcus Garvey and uh, Dr. Dubois in America, the Back to Africa movement, the Pan-African movement. Jomo Kenyatta had been to Europe and other people had been here too and they'd been reading a lot about it. They were also inspired by Mahatma Gandhi's work in his fight for equality in South Africa and uh, the freedom struggle in India by the fight of the Ethiopian emperor for independence. And generally, the, the Atlantic Charter, the United Nations, the lot of propaganda that the West made during the war, fighting for freedom of the individual and freedom of countries, etc., that inspired everybody to say that, well, if everybody can be free, why not we? I mean, we have tried so hard for so many years to get justice and equality in this country, and we failed. And the only way we can do it now is to run our own country. There was a great ferment among the Kikuyu. They were beginning to break out of a situation of being uh, forest dwellers with shifting cultivation. And um, the uh, resentment of the Kikuyu at the present presence of Europeans in lands which they maintained to be theirs at the beginning of the century uh, grew and grew. It first of all broke out in the 1920s. Uh, during the time of Harry Thuku, went on through the Kikuyu Central Association, through the war when that association was prescribed, and emerged again at the end of the war, very much enlivened, very much more educated, and drawing on a great variety of influences, particularly among the Kikuyu. As more and more Africans learned to read, political demands intensified, 
but the authorities still ignored them. The question of leadership became an issue. I made a campaign in my newspaper to bring Jomo Kenyatta to Kenya because he had been here over 15 years. We tried to get a petition to the government to let the Kenya at the Kikuyu Central Association become legal again because it was banned. The government refused. So the elders, as well as myself and others, thought the only person who is uh, famous enough and uh, could uh, influence the governor was Jomo Kenyatta. Then I made a campaign of um, bringing him to Kenya. The feeling was running very high everywhere, particularly when it was helped by Kenyatta, who has been in London and had come with agitation. So he came back with actually proper and better uh, explanation. And this actually uh, work, woken people up, and then they began to become even militant. As soon as Kenyatta returned, what he did to, was to commence countrywide tour, visiting all the provinces and districts, which eventually managed to secure the support of all, or at least in major tribal groups. So that by 1947-48, two years after his return to Kenya, one could almost certainly say that Kenya managed to have the wider support of all the tribal groups. But by now, the settlers were becoming more and more dominant. In 1949, they produced the Kenya Plan to secure white farming interests once and for all at the expense of Africans. They were aided and abetted by loyalist groups, including most of the tribal chiefs and elders. But the nationalist movement began to recruit the whole population as younger radical politicians began to oppose the loyalists, the settlers and the government. The focal point of the movement was land. The agitation went on for a long time until it came to its end. By 1952, people were mad about it. Now, at that time, they were demanding, that is what it was, Mau Mau. Mau Mau was actually demand for soil, and later, they, they changed their mind, they said that we want to independence. Complete rule by ourselves. Let us rule ourselves badly than other people ruling us well. The idea of everything and secret everything ceremonies was in fact given impetus by the Kiku Center Association. The idea behind it was that we had now to unite behind the political organization and we had to unite behind the political objectives and aims and so forth. And the second consideration was that in order to ensure that because the government authorities were against this organization, you were not going to report a or B or C, who is a member of this organization or the office of that organization. And the Kikus in particular were known for supporting the concept of keeping secrecy as a way of keeping them united. The first mama of oath in this district started in 1948. That's when the first mama started in this. In Kiambu, they started a bit earlier. But uh, the first mama was in the Muranga in the Fort Hall district 
started in August 1948. And all this is spread quietly without anybody knowing. And uh, we start having people amazing. I mean, you come to this area, you find so and so is amazing nowhere and nobody to be found. It all started like that, very quietly without anybody and nobody knew. I was very lucky myself to have known what was going on with the mama because my aunt, who comes from Kiambu, had taken the mama off. And when she came here, she confessed to me and told me all about the mama. That's how I became um, suspicious about the mama. I knew to have a way up. I took the oath because I wanted independence. I took it in 1952, in the month of April. So then I became one of the freedom fighters. It was at that time I felt that I should make up my own mind. I should demand 